to me, see? It's so hard. And I'm coming. I'm gonna come. And I'm coming with the hard footprints. Me, the hard, see? Here I come now. It's me, the hard. See, I'm the hard, right? If it's hard boys you want, you come to me, because I've got them on. I must be hard. And to put the clocks back an hour, I've lost an hour's hardness, I've not. Good evening and welcome to another edition of The Tube. Believe it or not, this is the fourth, another staggeringly expensive extravaganza. And that was Fofo Spearjig. I've been worried about that all afternoon. He's proving a man can behave like a prawn and still get on live telly. Fofo was originally called Wavis O'Shea, but changed his name yet again. The oddest thing of all is his first name. Dog. It's a hard dog. And it's starting to rig next week, aren't you? And it pours all the other dogs in. Cement mix off the it's he and thought it was a fly, see? <sighs> and me, I'm, I'm not hard. I was hard before I was hard. Three dimensional vision, three dimensional vision. Well, tonight on the weight set you're off. <laughs> tonight on the tube, we have a 3D. We're going to move over this way and we're going to hand out these. Cause, and if you've got these at home, three dimensional glasses in the TV times, okay. one for you, three quid each, pay me later. Three quid each. Well, we, all right, we've got, to get, we've got to get over to the camera. Now, we're going to actually see, not a lot with those ones, let's just, well, we'll leave those to be handed out, and we'll just take a pair over to the camera over here. As you can see, it's a bit live. Yes, all right, it's like the black hole of Calcutta, isn't it? Right, it's in Delhi. Now, you'll notice that even the cameraman himself, on camera number one, is wearing these. Excuse me, can I just put these down? So it means what we're going to be seeing here is actually going to be in three dimensions. We can put them on the front of the telly. Remember, if you've got these indoors, get them out. First ever time on British television, you're going to be seeing three dimensions. Oh, what a spoof Jules is, isn't he? Well, there's a definite Scottish flavour to tonight's programme of the Tube. The Simple Minds playing live in the studio later on, and we've got a special film report from Glasgow. Items in that film report include Glare Grogan and Altered Images, Sophisticated Boom Boom, an all-girl Glasgow band, and a band that appeared in the very first episode of the Tube set the tone. But from the relative sanity of that, we go back to Fofa Spearjig, whose real name, incidentally, is Rod Stewart, and he proudly declares himself to be a genuine lunatic. Fofa has made records with such memorable titles as Anna Ford's Bum, and used to plague media offices with letters usually containing a fig roll. Well, <laughs> O'Shave, Wavis O'Shave, that's his other name, managed to actually present the ITN presenter with a copy of the album, and that, incidentally, is her on the right, and that got into the music press. Debbie Harry, unfortunately, was another star who managed to fall victim to Fofo, as was Toya Wilcox, for whom he had a particular soft spot. It was with some degree of disbelief then that earlier this year, the music press reported that the death of Way was to shave due to eating a mercury omelette. In fact, this turned out to be a prank. Well, the Tube's proud to report that we managed to catch up with Wavis O'Shave, whose new name's Fofo Spearjig, and we sent Nick Laird clues to South Shields to find out the truth. Believe me, the hard is hard. Hand, hammer, hammer, hand, me the hard, right? <coughs> felt note, felt note. Brought your book back hard. It's on that step. I believe. It says a lot for the, the character who hogs the sort of um, the streets, you know what I mean? I don't smoke or drink, etc. I'm not hard and take drugs, no women, all that, you know what I mean? But I mean, the hard, he says it all, right? If you're not one of them, you're out of place, you don't fit into society, and here I am. 
Right. That's how proud I am. And, and I've had 73 pints of beer and I'm not drunk yet. And then I've gone to the pub till closing time. <sighs> well, listen, I mean, there was a great comic tradition with people like Charlie Chaplin and Lenny Bruce where they yep. hit on things that were wrong in society and they laughed at them and by laughing at them, uh, sort of made you reevaluate them. Do you think you're carrying on that great comic tradition? I certainly am, John. Good. Thank Sorry. you, Lenny. Um, the only other thing is there seems to be this paradox that you caught the press on one hand and that you uh, always appearing in with people like uh, Debbie Harry, Tyre Wilcox, uh, even Rod Stewart and Britt Eklund. But in fact, you, I mean, you could be another Kenny Everett or an alternative Jasper Carrot. Oi, less of the but, Kenny but, Everett but, bit. But, less of the Kenny <laughs> Everett bit, right? Crazy Ken. But, uh, this, I mean, you could be another one of those uh, sort of comedians. But even though you caught the press, you don't seem to want to be famous. Uh, what is your ambition? What do you want? I've just got to try and get through my life like everybody else has to get through their life. But I have to do it my own way, which is like, there's a famous Chinese proverb that says, those who choose a separate path cannot show each other the way. So I'll just go my way, right? If you can't understand me, that's fair enough, you know what I mean? <gasps> but, uh, you know what I mean? But, uh, what, what? <laughs> You didn't believe him, huh? I'll punch you in your best friend's moustache if you didn't think I'm the hardest of the lot, right? I felt not. I felt not. So we'll not know I'm not at all, then. GBH being highly original and wrecking their equipment. They're just the sort of boys, actually, I wouldn't kiss with my mouth open. However, I wasn't supposed to say that, and we're now going to turn to Banana Rama, who haven't been seen for some time because they've been out to nightclubs and being rowdy. But here's the sensitive side of their nature, seen filmed around Salzburg.
Palmer's new song, Cheers then. Tell me a bit about how did you get the idea for that video? Because um, it's always been our ambition to be like Julie Andrews, sweet and innocent and charming. We thought we were. And did you actually do it in the same places as The Sound of Music? Yeah, every scene. Well, almost every scene. <laughs> but the stairs are actually the town hall we had to sneak in on a Sunday morning. When you were doing it, um, did you sort of get worried about having to appear live because you've done so much work on video? And you've got a tour coming up, haven't you? Yeah, we've got a tour in February. <laughs> yes. But how are you preparing for it? Because I heard that you were doing lots of things to sort of get ready for the big event. We haven't done anything at all yet, but we've got to do a lot of dancing and sort of singing practice. Yeah, we're going to spend a couple of months sort of working things out so it's perfect. Hmm. What kind, who's who's going to be giving you singing lessons and what kind of dancing are you planning to do? Um, well, I don't know really. <laughs> we haven't worked that one out either. I don't know, they've been drinking again. Um, on the, you just, that's the first song that you've written yourself. Who, how are you sort of getting around to writing? Are you finding it hard? Um, well, we either write together or sometimes we use other people to help us when we can't sort of find a bridge for the middle of the song or something. But um, on the album there's about five songs which are either written or co-written by us. So it's quite a good start. Who else has been helping out on the album? Um, boyfriends and things. <laughs> Their boyfriends. <laughs> Quite, yes, I promise not to mention any names. You're going to Japan soon. That's because of your Honda commercial. What happened when you were doing that? You did it with Peter Fonda. Um, well, it was really hard work for a start because it was about 100 degrees in Los Angeles and we had to get up about 6 in the morning. And while he was being pampered with fans and sunshades, we had to stand there holding things up above his head and dancing around. So. God, how they suffered. And you had a fight with him? Yeah, he poked me in the eye with the handlebar. <laughs> and then he tried to comfort me and I pushed him away. Oh, they've certainly been living with the stars, these people. And... Oh, take them, take them as he gets upset. Right, we're now going to go on to yet more of Bananarama filmed specially for the Tube by the Tube. Glasgow to most people south of the border is a place where you can have your face customised with a broken bottle for relatively cheap rates. We can pick up a free Indian or Chinese meal off the pavement outside any pub on a Saturday night. And we're Londoners only visit if they fall asleep by mistake on the commuter train from Euston. 
Well, Glasgow, Glaswegians and Glasgow itself too is accused of being provincial, aggressive and very backward and also 400 miles away from where it's all happening. Oh, I had no idea it was happening in Aberystwyth. But you've got a chance to make up your own mind about Glasgow after seeing this special film report about Glasgow now. Public transport and a lovely day going through Glasgow, as you can see. I mean, if you look where I live, I'll tell you all this. I mean, there's pa people build places like this, and I really do think that some architects ought to have their legs on them because yeah. they haven't had much of a clue as far as building nice buildings since then, have There's just been a sudden realisation from all the big major record company and record company in our men in London that, you know, 450 miles is not the other side of the world and they suddenly have realised that there are people up here who have TVs, running water, electricity and mm -hmm. good pop. And record players. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And do you, do you find that London record companies will come up and start servicing you? Yeah, well, they, they didn't used to do that. Simple Minds can probably be credited for being the first band to actually prompt that mm. because they had a residency in a Glasgow pub and they were actually the first band to persuade, if persuade is the correct word, a and men to actually get on a plane and come up from London to Glasgow instead of them having to be down to London and mm. book the Nashville rooms or something and do some kind of showcase gig. So after that, you know, it tended to open the floodgates. Are you similar to John Peel in that you'll play fans tapes if I send them in? He's like similar that. to me. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, I'm getting about 20 uh, demo tapes a week now. I've got a massive egg box in the house and I've got one of those posy Sony Walkman things and walk down the street with five tapes in each pocket mm. and get killed by buses, but it really is the only way I can get through them. Mm. Do you listen to this program when it's on? Sometimes. I, I never listen to the midnight one because I never stay up that way. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> uh, um, I listen to him sometimes, yeah. He's not bad. Did all the images ever send you a type? Yes. He, he, yes, and he, he slagged off my singing completely, said I couldn't sing. <laughs> Which is true, but well, he didn't what do you think of him for saying that then? <laughs> she beat me up. I want to know why you're called the Disco Kid, actually. I'm called the Disco Kid because uh, my pension comes up for renewal next <laughs> week, and I'm just trying hard to hold on to my youth, basically. <laughs> no, I, I said that Claire couldn't sing because on the, the Dead Pops that I single, the one I'm referring to, she tended to sort of do a a John Cooper Clark impersonation. It was more like a, a musical monologue as Reading. opposed to a song. And uh, her singing's been great ever since. Mm. I think she took care of my so words, actually. It's a five and are there any other bands that have sent you tapes that you think, you know, I was saying this earlier, somebody, that you think, my God, that's the best thing I've ever heard, and, and pass them on to record companies, and, and then... Well, the young ones are, are a good example. Another example would be perhaps Set the Tone, who are now signed to Ireland and are going to off to do their album soon in NASA, the Compass Point studio, and I have some early tapes from them, and they are very unrepresentative of what's happening musically in Glasgow. You know, they have a perhaps uh, a more American sound, which is surprising when you think that the guys just stay about a mile down the road, but it really is a great sound, inspired by American radio and the American clubs and dance primarily. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, that was another good tape.
Well, Grandmaster Flash has had a great sound for ages uh, from New York. It's mostly New York stuff we mm. listen to now because they really seem to be... I don't know what they do to their records over there, but when I stick them on my little turntable at home, mm. they just blast right out. You mm. know? It's a really upfront, upfront sound, high and technology is sound. There, is, there, is, there, I mean, is there a market for that here in Glasgow? I mean, do people... I mean, are there, people, like people can't get a hold of the records up here, you know? Uh, record companies are complaining about home taping and all that, and nobody can get a hold of the import records up here. Uh, I don't know what it is, distribution or record shops or what it is, but like there's loads of people, mm. you know, uh, other people are always asking me if they can get tapes and stuff and things, like we're lucky, you know, we've got a manager that runs around and gets them for us, but uh, yeah, people can't get them up here. And, mm. uh, Would you like to move out of Glasgow or not really? Well, I don't come from Glasgow anyway, you know, uh -huh. uh, I come from like the East Coast, I just came over here and met Kenny and all the rest of that over here. It's been a great place for me, Glasgow, it's mm. given me a lot, but... I suppose I'm a bit of a traveller anyway. You know? Dust on the shoes and all that. Yeah, so uh, I just want to see a bit of the world, you yeah. know, while well, it's still here.
Fair do. Well, before we continue with our Glasgow film, I think it's just important that if you look at this person here, if you're at home sitting with your 3D glasses on, this is hopelessly wrong. For all the silly beliefs, you don't put them on until we say so when the V, when the, not the VD, you know, the 3D. Yeah. The 3D comes onto the television. Ah, he got it wrong, he got did it wrong. He, did he, did he, this is stupid, right. Stupid. To have them ready like this, to have them ready like this. Uh, anyway, Muriel, tell us about Glasgow. Wasn't the architect awful? Shouldn't those people oh, be the architects? Look, wasn't the Brian Lloyd right here of the two bay? Yes, oh, well, that's very good, Glasgow. There'll be more, of course, later on. But um, I'd just like to remind you that Flock of Seagulls, Simple Minds and Robert Palmer will be playing later on in the programme. So please stick around, because it's going to be really thrilling, isn't uh, it? It certainly is. And See? now we're going to return to me uh, in a park in Glasgow. <laughs> Well, this isn't much of a slum, I suppose you're saying to yourself. Not much ghetto here, you're saying to yourself. Because you're probably under the misconception that Glasgow, in fact, is all slums and unpleasant. Whereas, of course, in fact, it isn't like that at all. There's some charming places, like this park that we're walking through at the moment, where on a Saturday afternoon, Glaswegians will come and do uh, traditional Scottish activities, playing tennis and tossing the haggis, eating the caber. And uh, we'll walk through here, we'll find out some more interesting things that Glaswegians do. And we're going to look at this gaily coloured church here. Um, and there's one of the great mysteries of Glasgow surrounds this church. In fact, one of the great mysteries of Scotland. Because we're going to, uh, which we'll investigate in just a moment. If this church was built in 1781, using nothing but fine Glaswegian granite, hewn from the Glaswegian granite mines, a few miles over the road there. And up here is the great mystery. These, which is ancient Scottish writing, believed to be from the 5th century, and we've had sociologists and all our research team has been looking in to try and find out what it means. And so far, all that's known about this is that the very last inscription there means Jimmy. Well, let's go and have a look inside and see what uh, goes on inside this charming church. Well, of course, it's quite possible that somebody in here will be able to tell us exactly the meaning of all that strange writing on the front of the church. This place, for the uninitiated, is the Hell Fireplace. And despite what you think its name might mean, it's uh, not a satanic fireplace at all, but it's uh, a rehearsal room and a recording facility for all different local Glasgow musicians. Now, when we go in, we're going to have to be rather quiet, because there might be somebody recording in there. See, they have all sorts of facilities like this laid on for the uh, local child prodigy pianists. And of course, they have a <laughs> hole in the floor and large rehearsal facility. So let's... So let's go and talk to the uh, proprietor, shall we? It's not just a studio. It's not, it's not a rehearsal room. It's not a studio. No. It's just a... It's just a place. <laughs> <laughs> just a hellfire club. I mean, is it more of a thing where bands can come? Um, I mean, the impression I get where a band can come and very cheaply get something together. Where... Yeah, that... Yeah, that is true. That's that's one of the yeah, things. How much do you charge an hour if a band wanted to rehearse? What two is, pounds. Yeah, that's no. very cheap. Mm -hmm. Well, the second thing that we did was the was with with clear and altered images. We did. Yeah, it cost us ten pounds too. Yeah, <laughs> first, <laughs> first, first, first demo was this. Yeah, this is our first demo. We did four songs, all for ten pounds. Right. Well, you can't say that. It takes more than that, doesn't it? <laughs> 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 it's really funny tape, yeah. yeah. Is that the demo that you sent that got you the first bit of recognition you needed? Oh yes, it certainly did. God only knows. <laughs> when you look back and you hear it. Don't you feel she should have given you a bit more now then? <laughs> no, no, I think no, it, was it, was it was our first recording as well. Well, second record. And also I believe you had Simple Minds, you know? Yes, they, they were in um, uh, a different sort of basis. We, we just let them in 
over a night, over a period of mm-hmm. a few weeks, and they just... They did they their had, own recording? Uh-huh, they had a photo studio, recorded themselves. Do, but, of course, there's another band here, which is the band that, uh, which you, I'm surprised you didn't mention earlier, of the great <laughs> bands that rehearse here, which is your band, Jacqueline, which uh-huh. is, of course... Sophisticated band, then. I'm the drummer. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think it's, it is hard being an all-girl band, or don't you think it makes any difference whatsoever? Makes a lot of difference. I think, I think, like, I think it does. Worse than except to say. It's not that. worse in as much as you get, there's a lot of novelty value and you get a lot of attention and things, but it only lasts so long and it gets a bit of a hassle after a while. And what was, in the beginning, an advantage just becomes a disadvantage. Because basically we think that we're talented, that we can write good songs and we will write good songs, we'll get better. And when people <laughs> when people talk about all girl bands yeah, and all that, it, it, it's frustrating, you know, because I mean, what can we do? We're all girls, you know. Can't help. Can't it help. It. We've always yeah. been girls, you know. Yes, yes, I'm not blaming you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is there, do you do any cover songs of any other people? Uh, I heard you doing a bit of. It's not unusual. Uh, yeah. we just start. We're doing that. Yeah. Um, we do white horses, old Jackie song. Just you know, what I mean from the television. On no. white horses, let me ride away. <laughs> <laughs> when, it, when, when you got Irene, would you have considered like getting a, a boy into the group, or did you want to keep well, it like? We did. We thought about it. I when I really joined the bunch, can play guitar. Typical sophisticated woman. Decided we'd get a guitar. So Irene, Irene was just, just a perfect pal. because she was just a, a good friend. She knew what we wanted. We're not we, musically. We're not very good. Right? Not oh, I wouldn't say that. I, but not I mean, like technically, we're not very good, right? I mean, we're not. Yeah, with all guitarists, guitarists mm-hmm. so I mean it wouldn't matter how influenced we were by other bands. I mean we could sit here and say, oh I really like such and such a song, but we wouldn't be able to reproduce that sound anyway mm-hmm. because we don't we don't have the we don't have the experience or the technical ability. So we find that anything that we do just ends up like what we do because that's all we can do. No, mm-hmm. not all we can do, but do you know what I mean? Because Claire, you I mean, did you have to go to London or did you manage to do it all from here or do you? Do you I think it's, you have to go to London because record companies are so lazy about coming up here to see you. So you really have to go there. But I mean, it's not necessary. I mean, I think it's gotten a lot better recently because of, I don't know, maybe people are... Well, would you advise sophisticated women to take their equipment down there and start doing gigs outside record companies? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, she yeah. can advise them, she like. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I would like it's dead hard, you know. I think it's, it's got a lot to do with luck. Yeah, it's different for every group, I think. It's really strange. You you fight so long to get a bit of attention, you know, 
and then suddenly you have to go outside Glasgow to get it and then they all want to know you <laughs> when you come back. Mm. Here in the, the green room, for those of you with black and white TV, with, with Jim Kerr and Charlie Burchell from Simple Minds. Uh, oh, <laughs> oh. Jim, the new album, New Gold Dream, it seems a bit of a landmark, is it not? I mean, how do you see it? Because Simple Minds have been through quite a few changes lately. How do you see it? In your um, not, see, we, we don't really plan sort of too much. A lot, of, a lot of things we do are just like in some sort of feeling or uh, intuition. But um, I think each year we've we found that, I don't know, there's just been some, some sort of progression in the studio and playing live. And um, I think what we've sort of really gained is, um, I don't know, ability just to sort of get these, these things through before they can get closed off because of productions and, yeah. and these, these sort of things. But um, I don't know, what kind of landmark. Well, <laughs> I mean, for instance, like when bands get very successful and they get big, sometimes lose a bit of the spark that they've got in their music. Are you frightened of that happening to Simple Minds? Um, I think that's only because uh, when a sort of success comes, there's so much, uh, I don't know, demand to go and play live, like or around the sort of world, and you're playing like every single night, and um, they just don't have the time that they had had before to spend in, in ideas. And I think that that's something that we. Um, we're really uh, sort of careful about that. We always we feel that there'll never be any sort of shortage of inspiration. The only danger would be if there was never time. I think it would be it'd be terrible to go on a, on a tour, say of uh, I don't know America or something, and and know that you've got a week to get material when you come back. That would just be pure panic. Yeah. I think it's you really have to plan, really. So are you are you happy? Are you happy, Charlie, with the way the musical content of Simple Minds has been yeah, going lately? Definitely would. Uh, Every time you go to write, we sort of have a new attitude, really, that is like sort of been an amalgamation of like everything we've learned, really, the experience. And uh, I think, like, for some reason, we just managed to sort of pull out extra reserves within myself, and, like, especially the last album, which is, you know, it's, sort of, it's really obvious that the last album you've made is always going to be the best, but we just genuinely do believe that this one is like sort of set a standard and it's really going to be, you know, like, require a lot of hard work to mm -hmm. To top it, yeah. Yeah. How important is, for instance, single success in the charts to you, or do you see yourself more as an album band? I think, um, I think with with sort of luck, we can have um, sort of singles in the charts, but I don't think we are uh, a singles band. 
I think we, um, see, we were a wee bit selfish in as much as um, we want to be top of the charts and on the front page, but we also want to be kind of private. And I think a lot of the sort of music we do, lyric-wise and things, are, are from more a private sort of sense. It's not like when yeah. we're writing the music. Was yeah, well, thanks very much. Well, you'll have a chance to see Simple Minds later on, so thanks. Later on this week, ITV are launching their first ever 3D television. So I've been looking at this book called Amazing 3D, which is basically just a load of camp pictures, actually. But it was started mainly in the 50s, so a lot of the things are like 3D romance, which you can see here, which, according to this, is torrid, vibrant, and stirring, obviously like a night out with the crew from Simple Minds. But there's also a few other good things. Most of the posters from oh, films wow. like That's Roomy, Creature from the Black Lagoon, and It Came from Outer Space are in here. And they all seem to star, something that Jules pointed out, girls with enormous knockers, because they apparently look much better in 3D. But this is, of course, a real Holland thing. The best one is, second chance, so real, every girl will feel she's in the arms of Robert Mitchum. So now, an interview where every girl will feel she's in the arms of Jules Holland. Well, I'm now with Garfield Kennedy here, who is the man behind uh, 3D, which you're going to see here for the first time, but it won't be quite as good as the real thing. Tell us, tell us about your part in 3D. Well, 3D on television has never happened before, and uh, it's, it's something which is absolutely new. It's, yeah. it's not pure exploitation as it was in the 50s. There are 3D movies in the pipeline which are coming up, and they're very exciting, but the fact is that uh, in the program that we're putting together, we're actually explaining just why 3D is coming in the 80s and coming to stay. I mean, technology has taken it right into the living room for the first time. Yeah. Does it mean that you can actually, I mean, sitting in your television, I mean, what sort of thing are we going to see on Monday? I mean, Well, some of the things that we're doing are real kind of uh, throwaway effects, but things like uh, a bat flying out of a graveyard and uh, things like a bull rushing at the camera and uh, smashing plates and uh, stuff which is just pure fun. But we're also explaining the science of it as well. And the week after, uh, on Sunday, the 5th of December, there's a full-length movie on ITV which is... Uh, it's a really ropey western, but it's tremendous in 3D. Yeah. And uh, the worst films can be great, can't they, in 3D? In 3D, they're really great. I mean, there are some good films to be made in 3D, but I mean, so far, an awful lot of the movies that have been made in 3D have been pure exploitation. You know, yeah. things like Friday the 13th Part 3, which is coming up next year in the UK. Um, We're doing great box office in, uh, uh, in America. But blood spewing at you. Absolutely. Know, yeah. but the thing is that for 3D, you've got to have these things, haha, -ha, the red and blue glasses, yes. and uh, there are two pairs of them in the TV Times, and they're also on sale in Rumblows in uh, England and Wales, mm. so get them, otherwise you're yeah. not going to be able to see the and show. So, when, when is it going to be going out? Tell it's going out at uh, 7 o'clock on Monday next in the programme called The Real World uh, Science Series on ITV nationally, and uh, next Sunday, 3.45, that's Sunday week, and uh, the programme is... It's as far as you can take 3D at the present time on television. It's very exciting, and it's, um, it's, it's a first. It's a first for ITV. Well, I'm looking forward to it enormously. We're going to, go, we're going to see a bit of a film now, but I must tell everybody here now and at home, put on your glasses, because here it comes. Put it on or you'll miss it. Here at the Philips Research Studio at Eindhoven in Holland. And from here, I can appear on your television screens in 3D for the very first time. You can probably see that there is a real distance between me and those cameras. And I am actually carrying this feather duster, not because the studios are dirty, they're not, but to show you one of the amazing effects of 3D. Straight into your lounge with a lot of dust. And if you'd like to swap over the glasses, give someone else a turn, I'll do it again. Absolutely amazing, isn't it? One of the other effects of the advantages of 3D is that I can lean over and come right into your living room. And a very nice living room it is too. But what about the Aspidistra over there? I think it needs watering. <laughs> well, do you need washing? You don't want to look an Aspidistra to me. Oh, you never tell. Well, if everyone put away their herring, now would you please give a huge welcome to Flock of Seagulls.
new single it's called Wishing
Thank you. This one's going to be called, in fact it is called, Messages from the Rings of Saturn.
next week we're going to be seeing some film that's never ever been seen before of the Beatles. It's going to have things like them frolicking about, there's a lot of frolicking, there's also live footage I've never before seen well, it's sort of like the Paula Yates interview technique. It's questions like, Ringo, are you called Ringo because you wear a lot of rings? And John, why did you get married? But here is a home movie of them on the beach at Western Supermare having their holidays and they're riding on donkeys and doing things you never expected. I was standing in the studio earlier. A man comes up to me, says, uh, I saw you um, in Canada with a millionaire once. Who is it? It's Rupert Iron. I say to myself, what's Rupert Iron doing here? Well, I'll tell you what he's doing here. He and Marvin Gaye's bass player, Jess Roden, loads of them, Playing with a fantastic band, a large hand, but a fantastic, the one and only. I'm not even going to tell you that because I don't need introducing. Take it away, boys. Don't you run it all out Sister, don't you run it all away 
Okay, welcome back. Well, Simple Minds is going to be playing live in a few minutes, but while we're waiting for that, we've just got time to see some film of our unknown band this week. They are, of course, a Glasgow band. The Tube team filmed them in Glasgow, and they're called The Imprints. really unbiased, understated introduction. Here are the best band in the entire history of the universe.
Say this is called someone, somewhere, in summertime.
Thank you, brother. Thank you. This is called the American.